Hello and welcome to Minter Dialogue, episode number 393. Today is Sunday the 18th of October 2020. My name is Minter Dial and I'm your host for this podcast. First, I'd like to give a shout out and thanks to Jay Hudemus for putting up a five-star review for the show. Please do consider to drop in your rating and review and don't forget to subscribe to catch all the future episodes. As for this week's interview, it's with Heather Ellis. Heather is Customer Marketing Manager at Descript, and she takes us through the rise of Descript as a premier transcription service for podcasts, using an ever more sophisticated artificial intelligence. We discuss podcasting, the Descript business model, how the company manages to work in improvements and upgrades, and the learnings made so far in Descript's enterprising journey. You'll find all the show notes on minterdial.com. Now for the show. Heather Ellis, thank you for coming on the show. Um, Heather, you are working at this wonderful company called Descript, uh, and we're lovely enough to sponsor our podcast festival that I co-hosted with Sam and Andrew. Uh, Descript is, is really one of the interest, most interesting players in this ecosystem of podcasting. Uh, but let's start off with who is Heather? Hi, yeah, so I am Heather. I am the customer marketing manager at Descript and with a with a team as small as ours, I kind of am the marketing manager at Descript, <laughs> uh, handling really all of our marketing endeavors, whether that's from a direct customer interactive standpoint or a performance marketing standpoint, brand, product, whatever we're doing, uh, I'm, I'm here to help with that. And um, I came to Descript from the music industry. My background mm. has been in various forms of marketing uh, for record labels. I worked for an independent music distribution company. I worked for um, Pandora streaming service. Um, and I worked for a live music uh, ticketing company for a while. So coming from the music world, obviously I've always been very audio adjacent and I've worked on a lot of projects that involve audio. So I was really drawn to Descript because I've always loved software that democratizes some kind of experience. I, I've worked on software in the past that democratized the music marketing experience and making marketing tools available to, to more creators. And with Descript, we're really democratizing the creative process. We're making it so that if you are a person with a story to tell, you don't need to have the expertise of advanced audio editing to tell that story. You can come into a platform and create a professional podcast using your storytelling skills and then, you know, basic human interaction with the computer. <laughs> That's brilliant. Um, we're going to get into Descript a lot more uh, as we talk what we are discussing right now, oh, by the way, Pandora, it's amazing how it's not available, or this is really unknown outside yeah. of, of the United States. Um, so podcasting. So obviously this is a topic that I, I, I love and I'm near to. It seems that you've also picked an area through Descript that is booming heavily. Tell us what is the state of podcasting in this summer of 2020? Oh, it is it is an interesting time. And I, you know, I think back to our, um, our, our main video on our homepage on our website right now, which starts with, uh, I think, I don't remember the exact copy, but it's something to the effect of, you know, at some point, you're going to have the thought, I should make a podcast. And I think a lot of people have had that thought <laughs> lately. <laughs> um, so, you know, the state of podcasting right now, we have seen over the course of the last handful of years, podcasting has been around for quite some time, but in the last handful of years, podcasting has really stepped into the routine life of so many people. It's what people listen to while they're commuting. It's what people listen to while they're cooking or, or driving or whatever it may be. It's become a source of news. It's become a source of entertainment. It's been a source of learning and when you look at some of the most successful by size podcasts in the world right now, it's interesting to see how podcasting creates this environment where even someone 
a personality with an expertise that's relatively niche can reach every single person in that niche. Like you have an opportunity to still be small, but be huge in a way. And you see that with some of our really, with some of the most popular podcasts in the world right now, where you have someone who maybe isn't necessarily a household name, but who's reaching millions and millions of people every single week, because for the people who uh, do know that name, they can always reach a podcast. It's not like something where you will have to have a certain streaming service to see a certain show or you have to subscribe to a premium channel in order to watch something like you. Anyone can access this content with few exceptions, but um, podcasting has just been evolving in such a way that is accessible unlike most other forms of media. I was listening to a podcast as one does uh, with Sam Harris and Sam Harris, who does uh, he, his making sense is a great podcast to listen to. He's got a premium version. He was mentioning the two reasons why podcasting is so interesting. And, and I, I fundamentally loved it. One of them is the, the fact is that it's available whenever you want, as opposed to on a time and, so it's on demand. It's it's light because it's just audio. You don't have to look at it. You can listen to it while you're lowing, mowing the lawn, uh, much less commuting, driving, or whatever. And the second one, which I thought was fascinating and really, really picked up my interest as to how long a good podcast is, is that he says, I don't pre-stamp how long my interview will be. And how that changes a conversation. Instead of thinking that we have 30 minutes and you need to slam home as the marketing manager certain talking points into the conversation. Mm -hmm. If the conversation is good, it runs. Mm -hmm. And you're not worried about me talking over you. Because you know you're going to have the time to come back and, and either correct my point of view you don't, you're not going to be as concerned about being stepped on or interrupted because you know that time is not the issue anymore. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I really feel that's an interesting reason for why podcasting is beautiful. And I would also add to that that unlike television or movies or music, there's a certain element of podcasting that does feel very intimate with the person who you're speaking to. And that's, that's not the case for every podcast. You know, a lot of podcasts, podcasts are designed to feel more like an old school radio show or like a television show where it is very uh, manufactured. And I don't mean that in a negative way, but it's very manufactured. But there's also a lot of podcasts that are specifically designed to be a conversation with this person who you admire for whatever reason. And maybe it's that they're just talking about their own life's work and you're getting insight into how they became someone who you were so interested in. Or maybe they're, they're in a position where they're learning something and so you're there learning with them. And it's, it's, a, it's an experience that you don't get, even with something like music. And music is so evocative of emotion. It's so raw. You feel like you can be right there with the artist, but the artist is still performing something. And I mean, far be it from me to say that music is not emotional because that's been my whole career up until this point. And that's, you know, anybody would say that I'm crazy to make a claim like that, but it's a different type of experience when it's a Try not to use buzzwords, you know, like unfiltered and raw, but it, it is, it's a, it's an unfiltered conversation with someone and it creates this experience that you wouldn't otherwise have unless you're someone who, you know, rubs elbows with this person regularly. It, it mm. gives you that window into a natural conversation and um, just shows you a side of, of a person who maybe you felt like you've known for a long time, but now it shows you a side that, isn't shown in their TV show or isn't shown mm. in their music career. So it's just, podcasting is, I think, in a way, the oldest form of recorded entertainment, other than like a, a yield phonograph, but 
it is old school radio shows. It is something that's been familiar for, for decades and generations, but now we're bringing it back. And I think we're bringing it back because like you said a moment ago, it's something that you can take with you. You don't have to be in your living room looking at the TV or you don't have to be at a theater or at a concert hall. You can bring it with you wherever you are and feel that familiarity or learn something or be entertained. And it's like a little companion. I think a lot of people look to podcasting to bring them from point A to point B and take that on whatever sort of mental level you want to. <laughs> it can be literally tra traveling from point A to point B, or it could be, you know, ushering yourself kind of through time. Well, you mentioned the word performance and, mm -hmm. and, and you also said entertainment and somehow I think that's where music is. It's sort of a performance and it's they're really attempting to do something. It feels like there's a, an intentionality. Whereas in a conversation, a, a real dialogue does have intentionality, but there's a, a more, as you said, unfettered, more natural approach to it. And you can hear nervousness in a voice. You can hear little sounds and little ticks in the way you might, I might lip, lick my lips. Mm -hmm. or or maybe lisps and, and different faults if you will in the way we speak and and those little things make us realer because mm -hmm. we're not trying to perform to a a synthetic level in in uh in podcasting mm -hmm. so in in descript uh heather you have a product that does a lot of things. I would be interested to hear a little bit the founder story because the way I see Descript, it being the way I use it is essentially to help make my audio better, to take out the ums and ers and you knows, but it's also a transcription service, uh, artificial intelligence that looks to take my uh, voice recording and turn it into a text that is then findable on Google. How did Descript get to this point? Because I'm sure there were many parts to the journey. Yeah, um, there, there have been many parts to the journey and it's been a journey that I think is about, about a five year path at this point. Um, and it started and I can't tell you exactly Andrew's thought process, Andrew Mason, uh, when this all started, but it started actually as a completely different idea. Um, originally, it was a company called Detour. And the idea was that you had these audio guides of walking tours through places. And uh, that idea sort of developed for a little while and, and grew a little bit. But what happened ultimately is part of Detour got acquired and went one way and the transcription piece broke off as sort of this unique standalone concept and started to develop into what is now Descript. And I think we'd be remiss to also not talk about how simultaneously there was this other company in Montreal called Liarbird that was developing voice cloning technology. And while the transcription technology of Descript was developing and kind of finding its, its footing and finding its home, you know, figuring out what it was gonna grow up to become. Lyrebird was this really, really cool technology that was kind of sitting off to the side without a container. It was like functionality that didn't live anywhere. And as Descript continued to grow and really find its path and what it was going to become, it made sense for these two ideas to come together to, to become this new idea where you have a transcription based audio software that could create audio, it could record audio, it could manage audio. And at the end, you have audio, but you also have this shippable, nice transcript that can then go off and do so many things. Um, so hopefully that's a sufficient journey. I, I'm sure there's just tons Beautiful. of details that predate me, but. <laughs> well, of course, there's that, but that's a fascinating story. I didn't know it. And uh, I, w I wanted to bring up a little story where I was listening to Freakonomics, another great podcast. 
and um, Lev Levitin, the, the, the main guy, Daniel, says um, uh, an incorrect fact, uh, saying that um, the number of people that were killed by the Spanish flu in 1918 was 5 million. And I was like, that's not true. So I tweet him and I say, you said 5 million, that's inaccurate. You know, you sh it's 50 million is generally the acquired number, but some people say 100 million, but it certainly wasn't 5 million. Anyway, within something like, I would say an hour, they had fixed the podcast. And I'm wondering if they didn't use the live, what's it called, live bird? Um, well, now it's called overdub, but yeah. Overdub to just shift from 5 million to 50 million yep. because they can presumably use a technology like that. Maybe they used mm -hmm. that technology in order to do it because otherwise he might've been driving somewhere that have been painful. That's a big ass yeah. podcast and, yeah. and having that ability to adjust and have his voice say 50 is, is that's a great little example of, of a usage for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's, one of the things that sets up, there's a whole tangent that I could go down here, but for now, suffice it to say, that's one of the things that demonstrates how a different philosophy went into building this platform than what you would see in a lot of other DAWs, digital audio workspaces. Yeah, digital audio workspaces. By the way, I loved your term before being audio adjacent. That was a, a, a delightful, <laughs> delicious description. Thank uh, you. I, 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 th I just, the things that go through my mind as I'm listening to you. Um, so in, in terms of voice to text, uh, I've been familiar with this space from quite a while ago. And, and clearly from a Google standpoint, voice is pretty useless because it doesn't search voice. Today, whether it's images, video, or audio, it needs to have the word, the written word, in order to be searchable. So it, it seems like a really interesting place to be. The technology behind taking voice into word, of course, is gonna be difficult when you've got different accents. You know, Let's just take North America for one, A, you know, you've got Montreal and down to Texas, Miami. We were talking about that before. And those, all those accents make, must make it difficult for the technology, not to mention British English, Australians, South mm -hmm. Africans, and so on. So to take us through the, where you can understand, because obviously you're not an AI specialist, <laughs> but where we are in making mm -hmm. that transcription happen. Yeah. Um, it's an interesting journey with where do you start? Where do you go with step two? Where do you go with step 50? Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of choices that are, are made and there's a lot of logic jumps that you kind of have to make to know how that journey, what that journey is going to look like. So we obviously starting with what we know, we have, the team in Montreal that was founding Lyrebird and founding that technology. Then we have the team that worked on our early transcription that was based in California and in the Bay Area. And um, how that has evolved over time is that our technology works with English. It has learned a lot of accents. It works fairly well with a number of different accents, but jumping from what we decide is acceptably good, very good technology for English into what is very good technology for another language. That's a very, very big jump. Mm -hmm. And not least of which because you jump to other accents, you're starting to use different alphabets. You're starting to use different grammar and syntax. And, and we, we it's starting from square one. So what, what our Andrew Mason has often said is, you know, what, what we've built is good, but we want to get to a point where we consider it to be what it needs to be before we branch off and, and start from scratch with another language. You know, we want to get yeah. to what we see as our optimal offering for our first try 
you know, for our first avenue before we create a parallel path and start with another language. Mm. So, of course, ultimately, we want to be available and used by any language. We want to be able to branch off into a world where we're useful for creators all over the place, speaking all different languages and all different accents. But we've made the intentional choice to do our very best with our first try before we start just sort of splattering effort all over the place. Um, yeah. So when you are looking at transcribing voice into text, to what extent, what are the challenges outside of accents? Because at some level I'm thinking, as a, you know, I, I worked on empathy and artificial intelligence and, and I, I, I put my nose into this notion of understanding the human being. Mm -hmm. When you're into understanding meaning in a sentence, mm -hmm. where you, that involves understanding that, you know, comma, something different, or you know what I mean, to understand the difference between those two you knows mm -hmm. is really understanding meaning. Yes. And, yes. and then I was wondering to what extent that that means you need to understand the human being. And I'm wondering where the conversations are within yeah. that part of it, because I, I, I find that fascinating as we explore artificial intelligence mm -hmm. and you're in one zone within it because understanding one another, there are visual cues, there are all sorts of other things that happen in understanding a human being. Mm -hmm. But if you zero in on this notion of the words coming out of my mouth, and, and really trying to understand that in its context. Mm -hmm. where, where, tell, us, tell us what you think about that. You actually just hit a couple of the main points. Um, if you start from the, the question or the problem of, I want to create voice to text software. One of the first things that you think about is how differently you speak versus write. And anyone who's written a script for voiceover has probably experienced this before where if you just, if you're a writer and you write a paragraph and then you read it out loud, you'll often say to yourself, this sounds weird out loud. It, like when I'm reading quietly to myself, my brain and my lips aren't moving, it's fine. But we speak in run on sentences. We speak in partial thoughts. We speak in complex comma semicolon dash parentheses like we speak chaotically <laughs> and developing voice to text software that acknowledges that is obviously a great challenge so one of the first things to consider is training the technology to listen to intonation and inflection and pauses and pacing to understand okay this was a comma this is a new paragraph this is the end of the sentence or not. Um, that's just one huge challenge in and of itself. And that's something that, like even with what I just said right now, I said, that's something that, and then I paused for an hour and a half and then I kind of started a new thought. Like that's not <laughs> No how, exaggeration, you don't exaggerate. No, it's precisely 90 minutes. Um, but no, it's, it's, it's something that written, you would never write a sentence like that. That's terrible syntax, but, since we're speaking in real time with how we're thinking, we're not always going to form clean, cute little sentences. So that's challenge number one. Challenge number two is also what you touched on where we call them filler words. So things like, um, uh, you know, like, well, filler words. It's what you say while you're deciding what to say. And within the context of a just naturally spoken conversation, You'll say the word like, you'll say the words you know, and sometimes it will be in a sentence. I did this like I did that. Or you know that one time when, <laughs> you're, you're, you use them like real words. But contextually, this is where our machine learning comes into play. Contextually, there are times when you have a long pause and then you say, hmm, and then you say, you know, and then you start a sentence. And contextually, our software picks up that that you know was a filler word. That you know was not part of a thought. Just like that mm, wasn't part of a thought or just like when, you're st when you are stammering and trying to come up with a thought, you'll go like, 
like, okay, thought. Our technology will pick up on that because that is obviously not part of a sentence. That's not part of a complete thought. So that actually is technology that we just developed and released a couple of weeks ago. It's the pro version of our filler words detection. Um, and it's really interesting how through studying human speech, we can identify these patterns that are universal to English speakers, at least to start, uh, that are universal where we do have these really common words or phrases that all of us just sort of say to fill the gap <laughs> while we're trying to put together a real thought. So it's, really, it, it's quite interesting, but those are serious challenges. You know, if you, I just did it. If you just let your transcription run wild, it would be nonsense. Right. And so first of all, imagine this, descripting this conversation that oh, we yeah. just had. Yeah. That's, that's a nightmare because actually the ums and ers are actually verbs and sentences. <laughs> part of what we wanted to say so that's yeah. just a fun that's a good funny luck editing meta. have fun yeah. <laughs> exactly <laughs> one first question is to what extent the machine learning is going to be based off the individual that's being listened or that is just added into the database of the learning set for everybody mm -hmm. can you can you do individualized learning or is it just thrown back into the bigger learning set? That's a really good question. And for our common practice, we, your recordings and your data are your own. By recording into Descript, you're not tacitly giving us permission to study your recordings. So for that reason, we cannot, from a transcription standpoint, study you personally and make choices based on you personally, because it's the, it's the broad set of actual research that we've done rather than just creeping on all of our users to gather this information. Um, we have learned from a, a broad set of conversations, let's say. So although it's not individualized, we have a, a broad enough data set that we can understand in different contexts the way that these pauses or filler words will manifest. So um, I guess it's kind of a roundabout way of zeroing in on your question, to which the answer is basically no. We're not doing individual studying. So the Descript is not, for example, going to get more and more attuned to you as you use it. The second question pertains to conversation. So we have a lot of chatbots that are attempting to understand what's being said and to what extent is understanding what's being said as opposed to just making a transcript is important. Do, 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 you, do you need absolutely to understand that that was a deep thought mm -hmm. or not mm -hmm. in order to be able to transcribe it? Or you can just stay light mm -hmm. in the, well, this is what we think that that was, right. as opposed right. to really understanding what the sentence was meant to mean. Right. Um, another very good question. We take context into account in a couple of ways. And context is a combination of, I suppose what you're using the word understanding to mean, as well as, and I guess the more dry version of understanding is analysis. So mm -hmm. like I was saying a moment ago with filler words, there needs to be a level of understanding in the AI to know that that filler word was just rambling versus that quote unquote filler word was part of a sentence. So there's that level of understanding of this is what a sentence sounds like, any sentence, this is what a sentence sounds like versus this is just someone making random sounds until they're ready to talk. There's also a level of understanding when we're specifically talking about our overdub technology, our voice cloning. We have something within overdub called styles where, for example, that sentence that I just said I raised my voice at the end. I, there's a little bit of a lilt to it. Or if I'm doing a dry reading of maybe a disclaimer, I would speak very even. I would not 
have a lot of intonation. I would not vary my pace. Or if I'm excited, maybe I'm going to talk a little bit faster and I'm going to ha have more emotion. Those, that, that level of understanding is also something that our technology has to be able to do because imagine using overdub where I am quoting that statistic that you, that you mentioned a few moments ago. And maybe I'm, maybe I'm, quoting it somewhat emphatically. Maybe I'm saying, you know, a hundred years ago, this terrible thing happened and this many people died and I'm emphatic. Or maybe I'm reading it more as a reporter and I'm saying, you know, in the 1918 pandemic, this many people died. If you're replacing that number and one of them you replace it with in your cold reading, you replace it with an emphatic 50 million. It's like, oh God, that was, that was weird. Wrong. That was yeah. weird. So the technology does have to understand context it has to understand tone it has to understand not just what words are being said but what is being communicated and then match that so is the machine listening to you is the machine communicating back like it's more of this analysis and replicating mm -hmm. all the the timbre of your voice the speed the uh the the pitch all of that it's it's looking at it just as ones and zeros, beeps and boops, sure. and then replicating. So understanding, if that's mm -hmm. the word you want to use, maybe, right. but it's, it's analyzing. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. That's a great uh, way to explain it. I, I think of um, how IBM has been automating the process of capturing the highlights of, in this particular case, Wimbledon. Mm -hmm. And in order to assess what's worth, uh, how do you reduce a three-hour match, let's say, to two minutes and 30 seconds? Right. To understand which were the important points. So they, they use other contextual indicators that show, oh, the crowd, <gasps> That that was that was a oh an amazing shot. And you know, the the level of the applause or other elements that they can then use to automatically indicate what's relevant. And it makes me think of with Descript, how it would be lovely at one point where I could just punch highlight the important points, right? Of a, of mm -hmm. a, of a long conversation mm -hmm. so that you would automatically know what were the key thoughts. Yep. And then those become my show notes and hallelujah, mm -hmm. I'm dusted. <laughs> right. But you, right now it sort of seems like, well, you can base it on the, change of pitch, tone of emotion, maybe mm -hmm. there's a seriousness, but that's not where we, we're, that's not where we're at yet. Mm -hmm. So uh, tell us in, uh, for Descript, what is the, the business model? Uh, how do you make money and, and where are you in the evolution? Because of course, yeah. that's also something that moves along over of time course. as you learn. Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, I joined the company about four months ago. And even in those four months, the structure of the company from a user standpoint, when I started is not what it is now. Um, we currently, we're a subscription based product. So you don't buy the license and then have to buy a new license as the product updates for a subscription. So um, you have the option to of course, try our products for free. And then if you want to get the full benefits of our full feature set, you can subscribe to one of our plans. And we basically have two core plans and then a fancy version that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, our initial core plan, Descript Creator, is it's our full editing suite, everything that you need to import, transcribe, record, edit, ship out a podcast or a basic video, both there. Our Descript Pro plan has uh, all of that plus the more advanced workflow tools like Overdub, like our professional, our uh, Filler Words Pro or customizable audiograms. Like there's, there's some more advanced versions of the tools in our creator plan, but it's the same basic platform. Podcast, or I won't say podcasting, I'll say audio because you can do a lot with it, not just make a podcast. Audio, uh, video, meeting notes, transcription, business cases. And then we do have an enterprise um, plan, an enterprise program, and that's best suited for larger teams that have um, a need for uh, several people, you know, at least more than five-ish, 
that's not a hard rule, but like just as a rule of thumb, at least more than five people who maybe they all need full editor access. Maybe half the team needs full editor access and half the team kind of needs like read only, or this team is going to heavily use overdub and people need different access to different overdub voices. Like our enterprise plan is a little bit more um, customizable to your specific needs. And um, in the past, when we first came out, just like everybody, it was like, come use our product. And now it's like, okay, come use our product, but you can kind of make, make it what you need to. And as we develop in the future, you know, we have really positioned ourselves for the last year or so as like on our homepage, it says Descript, it's how you make a podcast. We've really focused in on that use case in order to be very crisp and clear about what we're best at. As the product develops further, we're going to be equally good at a few other things as well. And that will likely come with it, the need to differentiate, okay, I only work in this particular use case. And so all the stuff that's optimized for that over there maybe isn't what I need. So there's a potential in the future, and I'm literally making this up right now, but there's a potential in the future to differentiate our, our plan our plans and our access even further because we're going to be serving a larger base of creators mm -hmm. with different needs. One of the challenges with any of these types of SaaS tech companies is prioritizing the workflow for improvements, mm -hmm. bugs that are found. I mean, at the very first level, you have bugs on the website, you know, or the surround sound services chat that sort of stuff and then there's the actual technology behind the transcription or the dubbing services and and where do you put what in terms of the limited amount mm -hmm. of time your programmers have mm -hmm. in the short amount of time you've been at the company heather how how have you seen that being handled because that surely is one of the big challenges that all tech companies, especially Absolutely. working with AI. From my vantage point, I think there are two really strong factors that contribute to the way that we build. And the first one is our product team is incredibly impressive. <laughs> they are a highly nimble and efficient group of fairly senior very accomplished and lovely people building a product. And we work on relatively, um, relatively focused sprints. It's, I, I feel like it's kind of unfair to say, I've actually never worked at a startup of this size before, so I don't have a lot of um, things to, to compare to. I've, I've worked at much larger companies. Um, and I guess with a team of this size, we, we just have people who are just cranking out features large and small features that are you know the v1 and we're not going to tell anybody until like v4 or whatever it is we have a lot of people who are um just jamming away making all of these improvements and you can see it with the with the velocity at which the product grows and evolves and so i think one factor of of my response here is just having a team that knows their mission and is working feverishly on this really focused goal. So it's part two is establishing that focused goal. And you really have to hand it to Andrew for having a long-term vision as complex as, you know, what, what he's communicated to, to us, being able to distill it down to, this is what we need to do right now to get where we want to get in X, Y, Z number of years. And the way that our roadmap gets built and adapts and, and evolves and changes, but it adapts and evolves and changes within a clear and understood lane. Um, I think that's really a testament to how much this product has grown mm -hmm. um, in, I suppose, officially speaking, the two or so years that it's been alive. I feel like I'm doing something wrong with that timeline, but um, the, the one year that, you know, Descript 3.0 3 is when we made our declaration that like we are ready to be a podcast platform. And that was 
not even quite a year ago at this point. And the leaps and bounds of development in the last 11 months are remarkable, especially considering how many different directions it could have gone in. The direction that it did go in is so powerful. And in the last couple of months, I've had a couple of conversations with people who have said something to the effect of like, you know, we're a really sophisticated operation and we've been watching you for a while and we want in. Hmm, and that's, that's nice. I think, the greatest compliment that you can get. I should say, I mean, at the end of the day, what you, I feel your charge, as we were somehow alluding to earlier, is actually understanding the human being. Yes. And, uh, and uh, let's say, at least in the notion of analysis, as you said before. And so when you go from 95% accuracy to 96%, 96 yep. to 96.2, I kind of feel like it's, it's not a straight line. It's going to get more and more difficult to get to that 100% because there are so many different varieties and there's Heather in the morning, there's Heather in the evening, there's Minter who's angry, there's Minter who's, who's had too much coffee or whatever, or gin and tonic. And, and so understanding all of those is the, the quest of moving from 95, which is what you mm -hmm. currently offer as a standard within the pro up to a hundred percent in the future. Heather. Thank you so much for joining me. I enjoy your energy. Hopefully others have enjoyed our little timeless chat. Yes. In, uh, how can people follow you personally if you choose or and get in touch with or use Descript's wonderful services? Absolutely. So Descript is uh, on the internet. And uh, so Descript.com. Well, excuse me. What, 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 is, what is that? <laughs> Uh, the internet? Oh, well, we've, do we have another uh, while? Um, yeah. No, yeah, descript.com is obviously where you can go to just learn all of our, um, you know, basics and also to download the app and, and get involved, sign up. Uh, on socials, our handle is Descript app. Uh, we just, full disclosure, we're not super active on Instagram right now, but uh, wink, keep an eye out. Um, <laughs> but uh, Twitter, Facebook, um, Descript app. Uh, for me personally, feel free to find me on LinkedIn. I'm sure if you if you search Heather LSD script, you'll find me. Um, it's I've got curly hair and my picture is all smiley, so you'll find me. I'll, I'll um, put your link in the show. I'll put your oh, link great. In the okay, show. so people can find me there. Um, I'm not that interesting on other socials, so there's really no point in, in trying that. Um, That's fair. Yeah, but we also just if if anyone does need technical support the links to our help team are in our social bios. And if you go to the Descript website under resources, you can find our help team. That's where we have all of our tutorial information and all of our uh, technical assistance. Uh, be nice to our support team. They're delightful um, mm. and very helpful. And they have, a lot of people need a lot of things from them. So <laughs> I'm sorry. Please, please be kind. Um, be nice. It's a good thing to nice. do in the world. It's be real nice. humans. You know, I've been on the other side of those support lines before. And it's always so funny when people come in really hot, and then you make it known that you're a real person. And then they're like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I just assumed I was yelling at a robot. Like, why would you assume that? I'm a person. So, well, so um, many companies tend to dish it off. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. Uh, but we are people. Please be nice to us. Um, but yeah, so please find us on the internet. Download Descript. Play around. It is very, very fun. It's magic. You, people Heather. say magic all the time. <laughs> hey, Heather Ellis, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for having listened to this recording of the Minter Dialogue Show. You'll find the show notes and other blog posts on minterdial.com. If you enjoyed the show, please head over to iTunes to give a rating and review. And to finish, here's a song I wrote with Stephanie Singer, A Convinced Man.
challenge I know soon we all die I like the feel of a stranger tucked around me precipitating the danger to feel free trust in my reason I 